My name's Asby. Um, I live in Japan. I've been there for uh, yeah, 27 years. Uh, I'm from New Orleans originally, and uh, I think having grown up in New Orleans sort of prepared me uh, to appreciate uh, old, old things, old towns, old buildings. Uh, that's something that I brought with me uh, to Japan. And I initially went to Japan. Uh, I was already in my late 20s. I wanted to learn more about Japanese carpentry. Specifically, I was hoping to find or meet or see uh, a temple builder. And I was really lucky. I met uh, the last great uh, temple carpenter of Japan, a man named Nishioka. And uh, although I did not become an apprentice, uh, he allowed me to spend three years uh, studying his work and researching his work. And one of the things that amazed me, uh, because I, had, I was studying architecture and sculpture in college, and I liked to make things, and I liked woodworking, and uh, my understanding of good, word, good woodworking was, you know, something the proper shape and dimensions and well-finished and well-fit. But when uh, Master Nishioka would talk about his work and what was important, it was always in the context of the environment. He was always talking about wood about trees, about living things, about mountains, about the wind, about the water. Uh, this tree uh, grew on the north side of the mountain. It was getting wind, and that's why it's twisted in this counterclockwise direction. Uh, but we have such a way to use it. Or this tree grew towards the base of the mountain where there's more moisture, and it has these characteristics, so we'll use it here, et cetera, et cetera. And also he was thinking in a span of time that I was absolutely unaccustomed to thinking in. He was the uh, hereditary carpenter for the temple Horyuji in Nara, which is one of the oldest wooden buildings in the world, which was built at the end of the, uh, the 6th century. And the trees that were used for the columns were uh, 1,000 years old when they were cut to make the columns. And, and actually, Master Nishioka had uh, gone to agriculture school, and he understood that. And basically, by counting the rings, you know, he determined that. So that means that the tree, trees were standing uh, around 500 BC which uh, one of this, uh, maybe it was Bill yesterday mentioned, this was the time of this great consciousness revolution where Socrates and Lao Tse and Confucius were alive. And these, this building is still standing. Uh, these trees are still, you know, standing as part of the temple, and they're a physical connection, a physical embodiment of these uh, span of millennia. And this absolutely blew my mind, and it changed uh, my life. And uh, I began to, you know, look at other aspects of Japanese uh, carpentry and building and technology and craftsmanship, and I always discovered this uh, environmental soundness, this fundamental uh, uh, understanding of the environmental factors that, uh, you know, underlay the attitude towards uh, towards the, the Japanese uh, culture and, and their material culture. In other words, their attitude towards the stuff they're making and using. Uh, a few years ago, I got very interested in the Edo period of Japan. That was from about 1603 or 1605 until 1868, which was a very interesting period that we have a lot to learn from. Uh, and it ended up being a book called Just Enough. Uh, and uh, the reason we have a lot to learn from it was because they established what we would all consider a very sustainable society. And to talk about, you know, why I think it's it's applicable to our situation as well, the country was very populous. It had 30 million people. Uh, the biggest city, Edo, which became Tokyo, had 1.3, 1.4 million people. Uh, 30 million people is about the same population as, say, Poland or, or Argentina today. This is a, these are very large populations, and 1 million, uh, you know, was a large population until the 20th century. And uh, they have very few resources, uh, uh, you know, not a lot of, you know, uh, minerals, uh, not a lot of things at all, and very little arable land. Less than a quarter of the country is suitable for farming. The rest is mountains. And uh, this was very, very difficult for them to support this high population. But it has a good climate for agriculture. Uh, and uh, the people were already very literate and, uh, and very well organized. Now, this it was a military uh, dictatorship in many regards, and the organization certainly played out uh, in in helping uh, social control, but it also, they sort of ruled with a light hand uh, to the large degree. And in terms of the literacy, uh, certainly the samurai class, they were all educated. Uh, uh, most merchants were educated. And in the, the rural areas, the farmers, the, the peasants, they were about 40% of them could read and write. Uh, but beyond that kind of literacy, they were very literate uh, in terms of the oral traditions. And, and there were some wonderful things that went on in terms of uh, trans transferring uh, knowledge about farming through oral traditions. 
traditions. And the, aesthetically, really one of the unparalleled cultures uh, of the globe, I think, and, uh, and very, very skilled at design. And all of these things uh, help them make this very beautiful, sustainable society. Uh, and over the past couple of years, you know, I've met a lot of people who are also very interested in the Edo period, both in, in Japan and, and, and outside. And we talk about this thing we call Edology, which is not so much studying the history of Edo, but, you know, what was it? What, what is it about that uh, society that, um, you know, made it really unique and which, which maybe we can find some way to apply? to our situation. One is that it was a degrowth economy. Uh, before this, before this period began, there was two centuries of civil war, of overseas expansion. They're fighting wars in Korea, uh, trying to link up with trade with Europe to some degree. And when uh, the country uh, finished the civil war period, the strong shogun said, wait a minute, we're going to close the country and focus inward because those two centuries were very, very damaging, both for the internal ecology uh, and economy and both for uh, external relations. So they closed it and said, we're going to shrink the economy. This was really by, by, uh, by policy. Uh, the country, again, uh, coherently, uh, you know, in terms of culture, very coherent from one end of the country to the other to some degree, but it was also very, very local. There were just uh, lots of uh, thousands of local uh, adaptations in every aspect, from language to food to uh, agriculture to the way buildings were made. Uh, and the technologies they used, we would consider them low impact. Uh, very inventive people, very clever, and I said skilled at design, but they were always low impact technologies, very small solutions that were widely deployed uh, and could, could be easily made by people. Uh, and uh, in terms of, uh, although it was a very hierarchical society, uh, villages and the regions had a lot of, of autonomy, uh, both in terms of economies and, and, and a certain amount of self-governance. Uh, with, you know, uh, any kind of revolt was, was really put down in a draconian way, and there were cases where the government, central government, would, would really impose uh, uh, regulations and impose things, but basically there were uh, a lot of autonomy. Uh, in terms of the society, uh, one thing that really struck me was how often, how frequently they used uh, you know, tasks as opportunities for this cross-generational uh, cooperative labor. For instance, of course, planting rice or harvesting, but also things like thatching roofs or, or many other uh, tasks around villages and in towns. Uh, they were cooperative, and, and I uh, realized that these were great, th these were how children learned about their culture and how to do things. And, and we can't uh, under, underestimate the importance of having a society where everybody can make things. And, and everybody can make almost everything they need. And this was really the case then. Uh, and again, I mentioned they were literate, able to use information, and this was very crucial as they began to deal with environmental problems. In other words, uh, 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 the, the government would sponsor manuals for farming or for water management, whatever, uh, and these would be published, and these are beautiful things, uh, of course, written with text, but also beautifully illustrated with sort of how-to diagrams, and these would be disseminated. So the people would have a meeting in the village, and maybe the, the guys who could read the head man would read it and they'd pass it around and everyone would look at the pictures and they'd get it instantly. Oh, this is the best hoe to use for, you know, radishes or this is how you make uh, a better arbor for your, growing your pears. And uh, it was very, very important that they were able to use information that way. And I mentioned the long-term perspective. They were very... Uh, constantly uh, beginning projects that would take generations to be fulfilled, whether it's uh, uh, tr growing trees or waterworks or other projects. They assumed that important things would take generations. And, and all of these things allowed them to be very robust and resilient. And uh, tomorrow in our talk, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, the, the difference between Japan of that period and what we saw last year after the, the tsunami and the nuclear disaster and how unresilient uh, Japan is today. So uh, to kind of summarize that, you know, it was two centuries of the Civil War, and uh, the, the country was really on the brink of environmental disaster, mainly caused by deforestation. This, this ca cascade of problems, you know, leading down to, you know, watershed issues and uh, damaging agricultural production and just this whole basic collapse beginning, and they pulled themselves out of it. Uh, they, they, they pulled it off. It took about two generations, but they didn't, and led to 250 years of, of, of great, um, uh, of wonderful sort of a a sustainable society. So um, one of the things that comes to mind about it is, uh, you know, we think of things like water and trees and energy and waste and food as, as isolated things that we can deal with uh, sing singularly, you know, one by one. But uh, in fact, of course, they're connected. And I think the Japanese people understood this ultimately. It was kind of, there's a word in J Japanese called atarimai, which means, you know, of course, it goes without saying these things are linked. And there's very many aspects where they're connected. For instance, water and energy. Anytime you want to make hot water, that's using that kind of uh, uh, connection. 
And uh, if, you know, these, these links are not well understood and managed, you get these catastrophic interactions, this kind of environmental degradation, uh, which, which Japan was facing with a lot of, which a lot of our world is facing. Uh, but the same points, the same pressure points, the same connections allow us to, to turn that into a, a virtuous kind of interaction, a virtuous connection, a virtuous cycle. And that's the problem that we really uh, need to deal with is how do we flip these connections to make them uh, work in a beneficial way. And one of the things that I think the Japanese did very, very well was uh, what we call multi-form solutions, which is uh, finding a way to come up with a design or an idea or, or some policy that affects all of these interconnected things at the same time in a positive way. And uh, I just will give one or two short examples. I'm almost out of time, but uh, the forestry problem was, you know, really, really extreme. And uh, they decided to just plant trees, but before they did that, they counted them. They did a tree census. And of course, this is done on a local basis. They're sending just teams of hundreds of people out into the forest to count the trees, to find out what they have. And then they'll know what they need to do. And of course, they would close forests and do other, other policies like that. Uh, and they did things to find ways to transport the logs that wouldn't damage you know, the forest or the watershed as well. Uh, and in, in uh, you know, established institutions, like I said, multi-generational institutions for, for monitoring that stuff. Um, you know, for instance, in, in terms of fuel, in the villages, people were only allowed to uh, use deadwood, to gather deadwood for their fuel. And uh, they're not allowed to cut trees for fuel. And this means these are people who are living in the same area for generations, hundreds of years. And they understand the natural carrying capacity of the mountains uh, that surround their village. Uh, they know how much wood they can expect, and they know how the variation is from year to year. They will not use more fuel than they, can, they know will be replenished naturally. Now, that's like, duh, you know, of course, that's how we should do it. Uh, and that's the way they did it. Uh, you know, it's not like we, we will try to expand our fuel supply. So if there's someone who wants to establish, say, a pottery or a smithy that uses a lot of fuel, if they don't have the fuel, they're not going to do it. So they'll have to find ways to do things without, uh, you know, using more wood. And things like charcoal are grown from coppices. These are, you know, species of trees that all grow from one rootstock and uh, kind of hardwoods. And they would cut these. And 10 years later, they're ready to cut again. And they would very carefully uh, manage this and monitor this so they wouldn't uh, uh, use too much. And this had uh, played out in terms of their design for things they would use. For instance, cook stoves, what's called the Kamado, these clay cook stoves that have different size fire boxes and they burn anything and they're very efficient. The pots sort of seal right very carefully onto the um, uh, onto the firebox itself. So, and these are constantly, constantly being being innovated and and, uh, and modified. So, um, you know, this is basically to say the main thing they did. They started with the forests uh, and restoring the forests initiated the, what I say this entire wonderful cycle uh, that uh, sort of solved a lot of the other problems at the same side at the same time. Uh, and it was sort of a model for for the Edo approach to things. There are so many more examples. I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. Uh, and uh, it's, I think we'll find that there are a lot of things that we can learn from the way Japanese people did this 200 years ago. Uh, thank you very much.